Hi, welcome back to another episode of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome podcast show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks to all his super interesting artistic friends. Today, I have the honor to be talking to a legendary graffiti street art muralist known as Rhyme, or some people know him as Jersey Joe. Uh, I've known of his art for a very long time, and we connected recently in the last year or two, and finally we've met in person out here in St. Petersburg, Florida, while he cruises in his road map tour. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of resonance with this brother, both because he's like my same age and have been around the block of art for a while, and also because now he's walking down the shamanic path, doing different medicines and healing and growing. So get ready for a very interesting conversation. Enjoy! Woo! Between the women and a man Chris Dyer and his creative friends Darling, ooh, 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 how you doing, Joe, on this beautiful sunny day? I feel pleasantly relaxed. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's so chill out here, huh? It is. It is. Uh, even in the back cuts, it's quite relaxing. Yeah, this is like technically a back alley, but Florida styles. Yeah. Which looks like a nice backyard anywhere else. <laughs> it doesn't smell like the guy who smokes all those cigarettes over there uh, is taking shits. Uh, somebody's taking shits and pees back here, but we'll pretend it's not happening. Either way, we're oh, I just... didn't catch any whiffs of it. No, me neither. It smells like flowers. Better yeah. than a normal back alley, but we're used to that. And thank you for bringing that incense, too, to uh, make the uh, smells even better. Yes. So I have a lot of questions for you about a lot of different things, but let's start at where we're at right now or where you're at right now with the Roadmap Tour. So yes. what is the Roadmap Tour? Where have you been? Why are you doing this? What's the purpose? Is there a final goal, destination? Tell me all about this current uh, journey you're on. Okay, um, well, um the roadmap tour uh the roadmap tour is a project i guess um we started uh july 7th uh of this year 2022 we started in california um, from a base in uh in the desert near palm springs a place called yucca valley mm -hmm. And from there we started uh we went down to san diego uh we went to tijuana the tour bus that we're currently riding in, we picked it up in San Diego. And, uh, you know, just as soon as we picked that vehicle up, uh, we packed it in with as much stuff as we thought we needed and jumped on the road the following day without ever really having any, you know, uh, experience in such a vehicle uh, like that, you know, a 36 foot. Um, recreational vehicle I mean there's so many unknowns uh, that surprise you along the way mm -hmm. you know yeah so uh, we're traveling across America uh, visiting some people I know uh, but more people that I don't and uh, seeking out places that you know intrigue me one way or another or I feel that hold energy mm -hmm. Uh, some of the places being, um, I, I really wanted to be, go to nature and I wanted to make paintings in nature. Uh, so we went to places like the Grand Canyon, uh, different rivers, uh, went down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and usually in these places, uh, we figured out a whole way to, to unload the, the tour bus with enough stuff to uh, set up kind of like a mobile art studio. Um, 
Yeah, and I've been making paintings across America, and it's all winding down uh, to a show at the Museum of Graffiti in Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. That's coming up in like a week's time, huh? Yeah, that's a week from now. Uh, it's just been it's just been a lot of a lot of unknowns, a lot of surprises, and the best way to handle this whole tour has been to be as fluid as possible. Uh huh. And 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 in that sort of uh, flexibility, I've been able to find progress and success in, in, in quite a few of these uh, attempts to um, illustrate uh, uh, the emotional energy that America holds. Uh -huh. So this project is to kind of like capture the land that you, you're from in a way. Yeah, you know, I was living in France for two and a half years and um, I just had this idea when I got, oh, if I could backtrack. Um, I did a, in, in 2019, I had my little, at 39 years old, I had my little, uh, you know, I guess for some people they have what's called a, a midlife crisis, you know, uh, but I think that around that age, at least for, for men, uh, we kind of end up in a position of, of reevaluating the course that we're on, uh, who we are, what we want to do, what's a priority, what's it, what isn't. And uh, that whole sort of uh, chapter of my life as it began then uh, kind of came into my interest in psychedelics. Uh, I've always been very hesitant with substances as, uh, as a kid, as a teen, as a young adult. Uh, I grew up with people around me having substance abuse problems. Um, never done cocaine or smoked cigarettes or anything like that. I was always been indifferent towards marijuana. Um, I did LSD once when I was 14. Um, but I never really did anything until into my 30s. I, I did some mushrooms and found it to be quite different than a night of drinking. Uh, I actually, it sparked some ideas in my, in my head. Um, and... Uh, I don't know, I, I started to hear different things about different kind of uh, experiences uh, you know, with DMT or, or uh, then I started to hear people talking about ayahuasca or something like that and, you know, these things just sort of eventually introduced themselves into my life and as they, as they did, it, it kind of opened up some, some doors in a way uh, that, that I'm sure you know. Uh, I, I, I say that it feels like, uh, like opening up Pandora's box, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when you, when you open, when you open some of these parts of yourself up, it seems all fine and dandy, but then you have to be able to regulate yourself to some extent or find a balance in that rhythm. Right. There's no going back. Yeah. There's no going back after then, you know, uh, so I kind of opened up Pandora's box a bit at 39 and... Uh, and that same year, it was weird. It was like uh, in some of those experiences, I met what would I would come to understand as my guides. Uh, and she, you know, this one guide, she would tell me that uh, I can't go any further until there's something that's that's blocking me from going further. And until it's resolved, I I cannot come back. And uh, I couldn't understand what that was. And within, within like two months, I ended up finding out who my father is and meeting my father. Wow. And uh, it kind of, uh, it helped me to sort of uh, let go of like uh, uh, sort of feelings of abandonment, uh, some resistance to uh, being uh, emotionally vulnerable. You know, uh, my interest in graffiti certainly had some connection with uh, not knowing who my father was. Um, made me feel like I wanted to be accomplished at something mm -hmm. uh, or sort of validate my existence through being known for something. And, and, and meeting my father, it kind of it shifted all that. I, I became a little indifferent towards graffiti. And then, as I said, once my, 
once once I let go of that, I it's like I had more room in my in my heart for other things to come in, and then and that just immediately turned into my first ayahuasca experience and I ended up doing ayahuasca a number of times since then but uh, in, a, in a week of ceremonies in Mexico uh, I had some experiences where I was talking to my grandmother who I've never met mm. and uh, she was outlining the next two years of my life wow. uh, and told me that I needed to move to France Wow. And that I needed to move to France before a certain time or else uh, I was not going to be able to and something was going to happen <laughs> and that uh, I needed to be on that side of the Atlantic when it happened. Uh-huh. And it was weird and funny. I, I even recorded my friend um, Swinsky, like recorded me talking about it. Uh, and sure enough, I listened to it. I, I you know, I uh, listened to her. I, I went ahead I made all the moves to liquidate my life in New York City and I moved over to France and I uh, moved to Paris and and began work on like this show Maps for the Forgetful uh-huh. uh, it's a very ambitious the, the biggest show I've ever done uh, 52 paintings um, separated in on three floors um, but in my time there I moved there in July of 2019 uh, it quickly turned into the onset of of covid you know all that scare and everything like that and by um by say february going into march there was already all these lockdowns and everything like that and uh, i just found myself kind of stuck in france Uh, none of my american friends who are going to kind of crash on my couch or or hang out with me or run around and do graffiti. No, none of them were able to come to France. Um, I made some decisions in, in my opening of the Pandora's box that I didn't want to drink alcohol and uh, that I didn't want to hang around certain types of energies and all that kind of stuff. I became a little, I became a little, little sensitive and, mm-hmm. and trying to figure that one out. And mm-hmm. I found myself in, in, in Paris on deserted streets at night, walking without permission. They had they had uh, curfews and lockdowns in place. Mm. Uh, walking from A to B from my apartment to my studio, uh, which was a basement studio, really nice, uh, 20 foot ceilings, all that kind of stuff. But I put garbage bags on all the windows and it was just like a big stone studio. And I just spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time there alone reflecting on life, uh, detoxing from a lot of skewed habits in, 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 in approaching the world and everything like that. And, and, and directing a lot of my attention and energy into these improvised paintings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the same time, uh, learning how to meditate properly, uh, being able to, to channel, uh, that's something that I really got into is, is channeling, mm-hmm. you know, uh, or, or just, just even trying to understand what, the, what that is. What is channeling? Yeah, what, 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 what is channeling, man? Maybe you could tell me. For me? Yeah. Um, for me is to put Chris, the mind, to stand to the side and not control an experience and to be open to the most high spirit or whatever spirit in between to use me as a brush in its hand Mm -hmm. um, to create through me since spirit is not in the physical realm and I am I can create in the physical realm so if I can open up and connect to ideally a higher version of me or God or a higher spirit we can bring visions, words, vibration into this world to balance everything that's imbalanced right now. But at least as artists, we make images. So if I can bring images from the other dimension, that's my channeling service. Yeah. I when when I was in pa- when I was in Paris during this time, it was a it was like a four floor or five floor walk up to my apartment in the second district in Paris. And 
I did not want to become attached to that apartment at all. Before I moved in there, it must have been an Airbnb. It had like your generic uh, pictures of the Eiffel Tower and like Ikea furniture and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I kept all my personal stuff in the studio and I just went there to go to sleep and make some food or something like that. But once this lockdown happened, I just could not stay in this like Airbnb-esque, you know, uh, decor. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just started growing things and I turned my bedroom into a garden. I, I developed uh, real solid altar spaces, lighting candles, uh, really getting in touch with myself, spending a lot of time alone. And uh, I found that like with, with meditation, I don't come from that. I come from a working, working class family in New York City. Um, you know, my mom was a truck driver. She was a beautician, became a truck driver. Uh, my stepdad's a truck driver. Uh, wasn't really introduced to any of that, even art. I, I wasn't introduced to culture, like going to museums. Or I learned about art through my experience of painting graffiti or liking cartoons and drawing them as a kid, you know. Uh, turns out we're the same age, so a lot of the pop culture um, things that, that you grew up with, it's likely I grew up with mm -hmm. the same kind of interest. Yeah. Uh, so there I was in, in, in Paris, um, spending a lot of time alone and, and, and doing some, growing some things in my house to make it more appealing to be there. Uh, not really socializing, creating some distance with me and a lot of the graffiti guys. I found that they were kind of into different things. You know, they'd want me to go sit with them in a bar while they chain smoke cigarettes, which I find kind of repulsive, uh, and, and drinking. And I, I just didn't want to do any of that. It just, it just didn't feel right for me. Uh, and then I started, I would... I ran out of my weed edibles. I used to not be able to, to smoke weed because I was terrible at smoking. Mm -hmm. And I ran out of my weed edibles, and then my assistant taught me how to smoke properly, and then I started to be able to do it. I got a pipe in Jamaica, and mm -hmm. I started to, you know, do my pipe. I learned how to roll <laughs> joints and stuff. And I, I got into weed smoking during COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that it was a really great bridge to get me to let go of my mind a bit to be able to slip into meditative states. Mm -hmm. And I would lay underneath my plants uh, on a sunny day in, in my apartment and, and I would fall into those states. And I would find that as I let go of my mind a bit, there'd be a series of slips. Mm -hmm. And I, I would kind of slip into kind of like that in-between state. Uh, and when I'm there, I would feel as if something is being said to me uh, or, or a lesson and it would kind of come in a flash and then I would just... Uh, have you know like these kind of books mm -hmm. beside me and I and I would write down what it is or or, or draw what it is or, or whatever the case may be uh, growing up as a kid I I, uh, I would see spirits and uh, or ghosts or, or, or um, uh, illusions uh, uh, you know like I, I didn't know what they were as a kid I used to see what I thought were people Mm -hmm. And they would come when I'm kind of in that in-between state and I would think they're real people and then I'd find out that they're not and it would scare me. Mm. And then I would get all scared and I would tuck my feet under the blankets and turn the other way and I didn't want to see any of it. Mm. And then I would tell my, my aunts, I'd say, oh, you know, I, I keep seeing these things at night and they say, oh, you have the gift. Mm. And I say, well, they say, we all have it. And and I say, oh, I don't, want to, I don't believe in any of that or whatever. I don't want to believe in any of that. I just want to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my aunts are all psychics and all that kind of stuff and everything like that. Mm. They all are really into it. And they're religious and all that kind of stuff, too. So I kind of I dismissed all of that for years and years and years. Just, I just accepted physical reality, you know, all up into my 30s. And as I was there in Paris, I just started to become a little bit more open to it. And it started to sort of inject itself into my creative process. Uh, and then there was a point where I just felt like, well, maybe I'm just indulging a bit too much in whether it be smoking weed or, 
are eating some mushrooms or doing some DMT or something like that. I said, well, maybe I'm doing too much of that. And I went for a couple of months. I said, the next time I smoke weed is going to be a plant that I grow myself. Mm -hmm. And I was growing a plant in my apartment and I was taking care of it. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was, I felt like it was like my pet, you know, mm -hmm. and I felt like she was a her and some people that I showed the plant to, they said, oh, that's a male plant. Look at it. It's too big. It was, it was huge, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, um, yeah, during that time that I was doing nothing, I was just drinking tea and lighting incense and stuff like that. I found that if I lit a candle at night that I w it would just come even more mm. like in, in my, in my sober state. And I just started channeling a whole book of, of information about life and all wow. of that. And it just, it just seemed really crazy. You know, it, it just seemed really crazy. And it was all coming from, uh, it, uh, from ISIS, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the Egyptian God or, or the chem, uh, chem, uh, or set ISIS. Uh -huh. It's coming from her. Beautiful. Yeah, it was, it was really out there. And do you think it's like a past life connection? I, I don't know. You know, I've, I've had one of those, uh, past life readings. I've had a conscious record readings uh -huh. and all that stuff is so dazzling to to fall into the imagination of that you know uh-huh uh it could be you know i mean i'm just an aspect of everything right right um but yeah i just i just really fell into all of this all of this stuff and it it even went into the the paintings that i create i started to make all these paintings that i saw as portals mm -hmm. um, i started coding i started understanding like a lot of the the great stuff in human history has a sort of a, a coding in it, you know, uh, that can be read numerically or, or read uh, in, in, in other ways. And I started to notice that in the work I was doing. Um, I would I started to uh, create settings and go into states while I'm painting. I got one of these little little children's lights that like project stars onto the ceiling. And I started lighting candles and putting that in my studio and making my assistants do these things with me and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. yeah, I learned a lot during that time. And, um, how was the show? Oh, it was great. Uh, I did 16 paintings with my duck, uh, my duck EC. Okay. That's yeah. one of your characters. Oh no, you no, got I, a pet I, duck. I ended up, I ended up moving to the countryside. I couldn't take living in Paris anymore. And, uh, I moved out to the countryside so that I could be able to, to paint barefoot. I wanted to paint outside. I wanted to be outside more. I miss grass. I uh -huh. miss the sun. And pa Paris is great and all, but it's a stone city where all the buildings are kind of on the same level. Mm. And you have to kind of be on certain blocks just to even catch the sun. Mm. And, and that just got old really quick, you know. Uh, and, well, Paris and, is an intense city. Whenever I spend time there, it's almost like, wow, this is amazing. And now I'm super drained on, on, only after a few days. Yeah, I've, they treated me like when I would smoke weed there, they treated me like I was like, like doing acid or something like that. Mm. It, it seems like in Paris, they really love their cigarettes and alcohol, or at least the people that were around me. So I kind of, and they were definitely not on no spiritual vibe or, 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 or what do you call it? Visionary, uh, or, visionary you know, art, any or... of these people, <laughs> I don't, I don't hang out with any of these people, uh -huh. you know, I would love to, but maybe I'm a little too rough for, for that. I, I don't know. I hang out with my brother. Yeah. You know? Uh, well, being a visionary or a spiritual painter of any kind, it's not about who you hang out with. It's about you, as you say, channeling the, the higher aspect of yourself. Um, when, when you were in Paris, did you do those catacombs? or? Yes. How was that? I, oh, it was a wonderful. Uh, I, I, I convinced. Uh, I took the first week, uh, the first week of my, my assistant, Noel, the first week of hiring him, I had him come down and assist me in the catacombs. I went down to, I've been there a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, but I went down there with this guy, uh, Psychos. He's like a real OG kind of catacomb guy. Uh, we went down there with him and uh, we did a little DMT ceremony. Whoa. And uh, then we painted this big kind of chamber and I was painting with uh, like spray guns and fire extinguishers and all that kind of stuff and putting paints in there and and I just made this really big painting down there uh-huh um, yeah it was great I mean it I felt like I was in the belly 
of, of, of the planet in some way. You know, like I felt like I was in the belly of Paris. Uh huh. Was that like a positive thing or a dark thing? No, positive. Really? I felt very safe. Like mm, like you're in the womb. The womb. You know, of the mother. Yeah, and 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 it. I felt a very strong connection to the earth, being mm. being there and being having that buffer between yourself and everything else. You know, all that surface energy. Right. That is uh, sort of uh, mixing around in the city above. Right, so it's almost like the city is the human fungus growth, while in the womb it's just more pure earth and uh, mineral vibes. Right, under the skin. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very much, it felt under the skin. Um, but yeah, I had to spend a lot of time in Paris, feeling yeah. a little bit isolated. Uh, not you moved really. moved to the country with a duck. Yeah, I ended up, uh, when I got to the countryside, I was in this really beautiful, you know, home. Uh, it was like a like a five bedroom house. Wow. Uh, with a with a nice sized property, and the backyard was connected to my neighbors. My manager Claude Kunetz uh, from Gallery Warworks. His his uh, his family, uh, his nephew and his nephew's kids and wife. They all lived next door, mm. and they you know they raised. Uh, uh, chickens, uh, pigeons, rabbits, uh, and they just kind of were all on the property and everything like that. And uh, they had a cat. And I said, oh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind getting a pet, you know, like just to kind of have around, but like a very independent pet that just can roam the property. Mm -hmm. And I thought about getting a cat and it was a farmer's market that had, uh, you know, chickens and rabbits and all that kind of stuff every Wednesday and Saturday down the block from me and I thought about maybe getting a pet chicken or a pet rabbit or something like that and uh, the neighbors they said oh well we can get you a duck uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, my, my neighbor's mother lived 20 minutes away and she had a bunch of uh, Barbary ducks or, or uh, the Mo Moscovy the, the, the breed is called Moscovy ducks uh, and uh, her ducks had laid some eggs and um, they brought them over to my neighbor's house and put them in an incubator. Uh, eight eggs, and of those eight eggs, only one hatched, and it was my duck, Isi. Wow. And it was pretty cool. He imprinted onto me, and I became his, his parents. And, uh, That's so cool. He started off living with me in the house, and, you know, ducks shit a lot. They shit about, you know, every <laughs> 10, 15 minutes, you know. Uh, uh. So I realized that this is not a, an indoor you know, companion. Uh -huh. uh, so I had to kind of wean him to be outside. Uh, I started him inside, then I put him on the porch, then I put him a little further on the grass, and and then I discovered that you really can't have one duck. It's kind of a little insensitive or cruel uh -huh. that they 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 need to sort of be in in a little community of ducks. And then I was trying to figure out how to get more ducks, and then I ended up getting these two. Um, uh, they're called call ducks, or, or in French, they're called uh, canard mignon, which mm -hmm. means cute duck. Mm. And they're these little white ducks, and I got two of them, and I called them the cutie twins, Aww. as in is the cutie twins. And it was just me and the ducks uh, hanging out, and I figured out how to make paintings with EC. Uh -huh. I would th he loved cherry tomatoes, and I would throw cherry tomatoes across some uh, canvas that's laying on the grass. And I would put trays of paint or trays of red wine down, and he would run across to go get the cherry tomatoes, and I'd, I'd set up trajectories uh -huh. and, and make compositions with, with my duck. It's almost like you're using him to channel. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm just, just playing with it. I think that it's just, it's just the, 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 the comfort in, in, in playing um, in, in something that's meant to be serious. So, like, if you go through all the effort to put together a show, uh, there's there's a certain expectation that what you're doing is serious is is mm -hmm. is uh, professional or, or whatever it may be uh, so it's it's being able to incorporate a healthy amount of play a healthy amount of unknown into something that you're taking serious and and that's very much what i was doing seems like it would be such a hard balance to achieve this whole like I'm a big artist doing a free story Paris show and at the same time going through your uh, spiritual revolution where you're being birthed fresh into a brand new baby being. 
discovering yourself and expressing that process in a playful, duck-loving, countryside version of yourself. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 yeah, last year, last year I would be considered, you know, the guy with a duck. You know, like for people that would follow me on social media or something like that, it'd be mm -hmm. me hanging out every day in the backyard with my duck. Mm -hmm. And I and I put it all on my Instagram. I mean, I still have his egg, his shell. Mm -hmm. You know, I I had him from like a little yellow duck following me around everywhere and gardening with me and stuff like that, to him becoming this this big goose. You know, he technically is a goose. Mm. Uh, Moscovy ducks are goose, and you know, I didn't know his sex until he got bigger. But he he's he's a male. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like you know, I I looked into the the symbolism of, of of ducks and they they kind of represent rebirth mm. in a way and and you know he was very healing to my heart mm. uh, and yeah I, I really it was it was there was some difficult moments in that but I really do appreciate having some time to myself away from the United States or even away from my identity as an American mm -hmm. to to connect with uh, something that seems outside of what is normally acceptable. Uh, and that would be uh, getting into different states and being able to cycle different understandings through yourself in whatever fashion you choose. What a beautiful rebirth, man. Yeah. yeah sure. And did the show go well? Yeah, uh, the show went well. I mean, it, it, was, it was up against, I'm, we delayed the show a year. It was supposed to be one year that I was there, but then, you know, with all the COVID and the waves, it turned into two years, mm. which was great for me because I was able to take paintings that were supposed to be done in one year and make love to them for another year. And they became these like incredible paintings that I just could not let go, mm. you know? Oh, so you didn't uh, want to sell them anymore? I told him to stop selling them. Uh-huh. Uh, just understand. because I, it's like you become so, like, they they were they were very they're very much like uh, like like hyper intense illustrations of, of where I was at. Right, they're uh, they're, or they're your we energy. Or, or where we uh, even more so even where we are at. Mm -hmm. I, I I yeah I, I learned a lot through that that process and. I understand because I myself don't want to sell my paintings anymore. The canvas paintings, at least, like I spent so much time with it. And I'm like, wow, I just captured months of my energy and process. And what, I'm going to turn it into a product for sale as if it was a sandwich? Like, <laughs> no, this is for me to look at and reflect as a mirror of my process. So how did the gallery feel when you're spending all this time painting and you, you want to hold back some of the, the show's paintings? He understood. He understood. I mean, we sold. We, it was a successful show. We sold work, I guess. If, if money sort of uh, validates things, you know, it, it was successful. I made enough money to be here now mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing. Uh, but it's just, I, I've just been learning how to, to calibrate my, my sense of self or my sense of being here or just, just, just even understanding what life is. I think that, I think that each day that I wake up, I, I spend a, a, a bit of the day just pondering just something so simple as as what life is mm -hmm. you know how about i ask you what what is life man what is life <laughs> um what is this what is this thing that we're that in? is the question right um i like to observe it many times and i don't know if i'm right but it's a virtual reality simulate uh, simulation video game that God is playing through all of us as like fractals, but he's also the tree, the blade of grass, the butterfly in there. He's experiencing physical reality through all these different vessels. And I'm like his avatar. You're his avatar. We're all his avatars. So it, whatever the fuck God is, everythingness, consciousness, the absolute, can have the experience of being in a limited contained vessel that has pain and joy and struggles but also makes love and smells the incense and all these beautiful things beautiful and difficult things we can experience here i think he wanted he she it wanted to 
have that experience through us. So we're giving it that gift through our life. That's my personal belief. So I try to hold on to the state of gratitude like, wow, this is such a gift in every single way. Just life is a gift in any expression. And yeah, I feel it's our nature to move back to the aspect of God that's the bigger body, the absolute, and that is love. That is openness, giving. So I try my best to move closer to that vibration and maybe one day we'll go back to that everythingness and high five each other inside ourselves and be like, whoa, we were humans doing mm -hmm. this beautiful thing in so many versions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a whole sort of level of life that is non-physical that exists all around us and uh, that we can interact with uh, in, in some form. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I'd, I'd be doing things in the day and I'd, I'd feel like I'm half here. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, and I feel as time has progressed, like we're, you know, in 2022, it almost feels like the other spiritual dimension is coming closer and it's like mixing a little bit more. Sometimes I feel like, whoa, like I'm still in the physical, but I feel the spiritual yeah. world a little bit more and more as we move forward. So this whole experience in Paris, uh, you made it back to the States and it was that, what was the, I guess, was that the motivation to get you to get this RV and get on the road and experience it all? Well, uh, I, wanted, I didn't want to leave France. I didn't want to leave France until my show was complete. Mm -hmm. I went out there on a tourist visa, like a three-month visa, and never left. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for two and a half years. I knew that, I knew that when I made the attempt to cross back into the United States that there's a chance that I would be noticed and, and that I would go through some sort of situation of not being able to return without going through, jumping through a bunch of hoops. Uh, there was also the the issue with um, vaccinations and I just kind of fell on the side of the fence where I did not feel comfortable putting anything in my body that I didn't trust. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a child growing up in, in New York City I never had a doctor or we would go when we were sick we'd go to the emergency room and have Medicare uh, um, in my teens and, and 20s and 30s I, I never had health care, health coverage. I still don't have health care or health coverage. Uh, when I was living in Los Angeles, uh, I gave myself four years uh, in living lo in Los Angeles to f work really hard towards my passion and see if it very much is a, a, a it, it, to see if it's a career that could, that could continue. And by the time I was 30 in 2009, I had just landed this this really great uh collaboration with disney you know this, this you know i i grew up drawing disney and you know i'm perhaps yourself too mm -hmm. uh and it was just such a great uh acknowledgement from from you know this 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 company that has uh put out all this stuff that made a, such a tremendous impression on me and everyone else and I had never been to Disneyland or Disney World. It was something I always wanted to go to as a kid, but never did. So I just held it together and said, I'll never go unless I have a kid, I'll, I won't go. Mm -hmm. And there I was doing that thing with Disney in 2009. And I had, I had a bunch of money and I was working a part-time job teaching, teaching like kids in inner cities and all that kind of stuff. And my time was just too valuable to be doing a, a part-time job and I had the courage to leave my last sort of job for someone else in 2009 and I had money and I said well what can I do with all of this money maybe I could buy a new car I was driving like a hoopty uh, all my friends were under the the motto of fake it till you make it mm -hmm. whereas I drove a car that maybe wasn't so flashy or anything like that I didn't care about any I don't care about those things you know and I said well what's baller what can I do I and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get health insurance. <laughs> and I went and, got, I went and got health insurance. And I had the health insurance plan for one year. And then, like, within a year, I, my, I grew in age one year. And it went from one 
uh, uh, financial bracket to another, it nearly doubled. Mm. And I said, fuck that. I didn't even use it. Like it had a $5,000 deductible on it or something that I had to uh, accumulate $5,000 in bills before they would pay out. Mm. It was Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And uh, I said, fuck that. I, why am I giving this company all this money just in case I get hurt or get sick? I'd rather take that money and invest it in myself. Go, go take that $5,000 and go have experiences. And hey, I'll do everything I can to respect myself and take care of my body. And if I do deal with something, I'll deal with it on my own. Or I'll then pay and figure it out then. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did is and I, I haven't had health insurance, you know, since um, 2009, you know, and 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 I'm very weary about, you know, uh, putting things into my body or, or taking things or anything like that. Uh, so when I was out there in, in France and, and they, they were having these 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 uh, you have to have on your phone a QR code to get into. A, a restaurant or particular types of uh, supermarkets or this mm -hmm. or that, I felt it to be, you know, kind of fucked up. And, yep. <laughs> and they say, oh, well, this is France. This is how we do it. And I was, so, so I was even more so spending even more time alone. Never mind me not really speaking the language. I did take French classes for a year. I know how to navigate a supermarket. I know how to navigate certain things, but I'm, I wasn't really having conversations. Mm. I was not in France for the culture. Mm -hmm. I was there to do this thing that I was doing. And then I, all of a sudden, I wasn't even able to go into certain places just because I, I didn't vaccinate my body with this, this questionable uh, thing. Right. And uh, I finished the show, and then I had to figure out how to go back to America. I was, at that time, like, just dealing with some personal stuff, uh, uh, you know, I was dealing with some personal stuff and I needed to get out of where I was at and, and get back to America. And I went through this whole song and dance of going to Germany and meeting up with a guy that could help me get what I needed to get to get across the borders and all this stuff. And I ended up going to Holland. And when I got through to Holland, they caught me at the border and they gave me a two year ban, you know, because and, what you got was caught. Never mind that I didn't have the paperwork the uh -huh. COVID paperwork, uh -huh. they didn't even notice that. And I'm saying this on a podcast because I don't give a fuck. No, he's lucky, you know? really. <laughs> <laughs> but I, they didn't notice that. They didn't notice any other questionable things that I had in my possession. They just knew that I overstayed my visa. Uh -huh. And I sat under, in France, before any of this, I sat underneath my tree holding my duck, and I went into a very deep meditation, and I was able to connect to whatever it is that we, you know, are fascinated by. And it outlined, it said, it said when you get here, you, you know, when you get to, to America, you, you know, you're going to take some time, you're going to come up with a plan, and you're going to travel. And you're going to go across America, and you're going to do these things, and, and you're going to paint outside. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do. And mm -hmm. it, it just showed it all to me. It told it. I said, yes, 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 I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then it just built up from being getting a secondhand car to getting a van to getting uh, this 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 recreational vehicle tour bus that we've been traveling across America. Mm -hmm. And I had the idea to, to to recruit my family and to recruit some close friends and and to encourage people to to be in nature and to paint. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. I think that's like such a great initiative. And how does it feel to be in middle? of the experience of something that you visualized back then? Uh, it, it feels great. I mean, I, I, it, it's, it, it felt like a tremendous relief to cross into Florida. You know, I, I was very intimidated with driving such a big vehicle uh, and, and having some close calls with, with uh, you know, uh, just the gas tank exploding uh, uh, or getting punctured by, by a gate and not dying. In that process, uh, we've had a lot of really close calls, and um, I do I do believe that I you know I have some energy looking out for me in some form, and I do my best to to uh, 
to maintain that 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 level of care or level of respect by being a good person as, as best as I can handle mm -hmm. or as best as I have the patience for. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. And I'm so happy we, we intersect because sure. we were talking on Instagram. You're like, come join us here, come join us there. And I'm like, oh, I'm about to move states and I'm buying a house and I don't think I'll be able to, to meet you. And all of a sudden on the first week of being here in St. Petersburg, you're like, hey, I'm coming through. Let's jam in a park. And uh, you chose the park yesterday that we painted at mm -hmm. uh, because I had told you this, uh, this legend that kind of saved this area just like a week ago. There was a Hurricane Ian came through and it was supposed to destroy the Tampa Bay, including the home I was one week about from buying. And then it just, it didn't happen. And some people say it's because these native mounds were built here uh, that protect this area. So mm -hmm. it was your idea of like, hey, let's go and paint in that area, in the Indian mounds. So yesterday we had a, a beautiful day in that bay. Thank you for setting it up. Oh, it's 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 a pleasure. I I think that I think that that's what human beings do is they is they seek out areas that make them feel good. They express themselves in that in in those places with ritual or, or you know um, celebration or, or or having creative things or I don't know, maybe back in the day ritual sacrifice or something like that. You know, uh, but some there are some places in the world. Well, all places in the world hold particular types of energy, you know, uh, and I'm just kind of exploring that. I'm exploring that through the activity of, of letting go in, in, in painted work, uh, letting go of, of plan, uh, doing my best to create a vibe and uh, seeing if I can actually tap into something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've I've found success in that and 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 there are like little subtle things that come through to validate that it's not just some you know there there are ways that you know like a the term what is it visionary artist mm -hmm. you know i don't know if i'm a visionary artist i think you are okay but who cares how but i don't know if i'm in the club of visionary artists club fuck clubs fuck labels yeah you, you know, are it or you're not i, I mean, don't know you can yeah. do it on your own you don't have to like participate in any platform yeah, you know maybe one day i'll be in the visionary artist club or, or whatever it may be uh, it doesn't matter uh, you're in the joe club <laughs> i'm in I the joe club <laughs> uh but there is there is a part of me that really does i i i have had affirmations in 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 quite a few ways that 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 there is something there that i'm i'm connecting to and tapping uh, uh bringing out and um uh, Maybe, you know, like, uh, there are a lot of expectations, uh, when you're, when you're on your way to, um, solidifying who you are, your identity as an artist, you know, the people, people want, when, when people become familiar with who you are, uh, whether it be visually or, or your personality or whatever, th there's a certain comfort in accepting that. And when you start to deviate from those looks or those ways of being, um, people become uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say, let's say you decided tomorrow that you no longer want to paint the characters that you create and you just are completely fascinated by kites mm -hmm. and you just want to create kites. You're, you're just going to start making kites. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some people that maybe are a little upset mm -hmm. or, or feel uncomfortable. Like, oh, you, you totally off your rocker. You're out What's there, What's with man. this kite thing? Yeah, you're just making give kites, bro. Give me a bro. painting. <laughs> yeah, give me a... And, 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 and that's the way it is, you know? But you, you just have to not pay attention to that and just keep doing things, you know? Um, so I've, I've just been kind of making... Uh, making recordings of, of, of particular parts of, of the country, uh, and they're kind of like... A, they're energetic portraits mm -hmm. of, of particular places. So, like, let's say when I was in New Orleans, uh, the t it said, written within the painting, it said, in passion or potion. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's about that idea of, 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 of coming into an understanding or, or, or being in the, in the rhythm of an understanding of yourself, 
and and getting there through through uh, through through potion or passion, you know. And potion would be like a concoction, uh, a, a way, a, a, a practice, or the medicine, uh, you know, or medicine. <laughs> and then, uh, but you can certainly find some of that through the course of uh, of, of being completely. Uh, um, in, in a groove with your passion, uh-huh. you know, uh, or you could just put them all together or, 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 or go back and forth or, or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, the, the painting, the painting I did in New Orleans was very chaotic. I painted it right in the French Quarter, mm-hmm. right uh, on the Mississippi and kind of like an area where a lot of tourists are going to hang out, locals hanging out on the, on the Mississippi. I used the Mississippi water. Uh, and it just comes out, it comes out in the painted work without me even trying to overthink it you know or, or when I was in in Dealey Plaza at the site of uh, JFK's assassination like I, I really could feel it I really could tap into it and uh, on that site it said uh, what was written inside of the painting it said here we are in this wish mm-hmm. um, all of the titles from all the paintings I did cross country uh, can be read in uh in, 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 in a verse, like, mm-hmm. a, like a whole thing that sort of is a commentary about what this is, uh, where we are in America. Mm. So it's like a record of your country. Yeah, but, but each, each painting, like I didn't know until I was delivering all the titles to the, to the, to the gallery in, in Miami. I, until I actually put them out, I realized that they all go together to, to say something. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So, and this this thing you just brought up about like you know, oh, am I a visionary artist? Am I in a club? You know, the titles that we have to kind of like pick to define ourselves to a world that wants to kind of like understand where we fall. Uh, I would resonate with you because, for example, like I do art on the street all the time. I paint murals, but like I don't know if I'm very in the whole street art world. Definitely not in the graffiti world. Um, we're talking about this with Chor Boogie recently, and mm-hmm. he's like, "Fuck titles." I do modern hieroglyphics. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm gonna invent my own title. You started with graffiti, but you do a style that's kind of like got cartoons, and it's an evolution of that that some people would call street art, and in in this world of divisiveness seems like sometimes graffiti and street art are even fighting and that where do you fall in all that do you consider yourself a, a graffiti artist a street artist how do you bring some kind of peace and unity between those two sides of yourself uh, especially bringing some kind of spiritual channeling visionary flavor to it which i think is like the next step over uh visionary muralism or visionary street art is I think something that's happening right now, but there hasn't been kind of like somebody to, to kind of like identify that there are these artists mm-hmm. bringing like spiritual offerings to the streets, yeah. which sometimes seems like a contradiction, but like spirit is everything. So there's no mm-hmm. wrong place to bring spirit. Mm-hmm. Anyway, what's your thoughts? Like, how do you, you know, are you still a graffiti artist? Let's start with that. <laughs> well, um, as I said, I didn't, there weren't, there was not, People in my family didn't make art. Uh, they were more practical. Uh, 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 they did crafts or they did things, you know, um, like my my grandmother, you know, did, did crafts. Um, you know, my aunt read cards and made chocolate houses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up being put in front of the television you know, for entertainment, I watch PBS and uh, Saturday morning cartoons and all that kind of stuff. And I had coloring books. And just like any other kid, I, I tried to draw those things. But maybe, uh, maybe I drew those things, uh, you know, with, with a bit more uh, accuracy than, say, my brothers. So I would, it was noticed and then they would give me praise and then that praise was the reward and it made me want to do it more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd say that I really got into drawing more at four years old and continued to do that and enjoyed any opportunities to do that uh, as, as a young kid and 
I had an uncle that told me to, to be a good artist. You had to create your own characters. And uh, so I did that. I said, oh, I want to be a good artist. So I made efforts to Frankenstein together all the things I like and to what would be my characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and those, those characters, that look became my visual identity as, as a kid, which carried over into my interest in graffiti at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So I went into graffiti with an understanding that to be a good artist, you had to come up with original content or put enough things together for it to be unique in some form. Mm -hmm. And graffiti very much is, is about that. So I wasn't, I wasn't schooled by anyone. Uh, I, often the, pe the people older than me were more kind of dismissive. The people I did paint graffiti with, they were more like street bombers, like people who do tags and throw ups. Uh, even when I was terrible, I was the better guy of my group of friends. Uh, and when you're doing graffiti, especially when I was doing graffiti on Staten Island in New York City, uh, I came into it with an understanding that graffiti is not art. Uh, and when I would do some things that are graffiti related, someone would want to give me acknowledgement that it was good by saying, oh, wow, that's awesome. You should be an artist. You know, uh, if I could be painting a wall or, or I show something that I created and they say, wow, this is awesome. You should be an artist. Because the, it, it was just understood that graffiti was this negative thing. This is, is a, a vandalism. Uh, it's destruction. And it, a, a, a destructive thing to your, a destructive act to your envi environment and more so to yourself and your well-being. That uh, habitual uh, uh, graffiti activity results in troubles with the law, going to jail, all that kind of stuff. I've been to jail, and the only reason I've ever been to jail is because of my commitment to painting graffiti. Uh, in my early teens, I, I was arrested twice for graffiti, and then at 16, I was arrested uh, and, and counted as an adult, and it resulted in me moving from Staten Island to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, you know, I, I was into graffiti, and I saw myself as a graffiti writer. I didn't think of what I was doing as art. Uh, it was always sort of uh, imprinted onto me that there was a separation with all that. And all of this was going on. I started writing graffiti in 1991. Okay. Street art was not a term right. at that time. People were not talking about street art the way they talk about street art today. That came later. Uh -huh. uh, what was your uh, graffiti name? Was it Jersey Joe or something? No, no, no. Um, so I'm born in Brooklyn. I grew uh -huh. up on Staten Island. Uh, I moved to New Jersey in the beginning of 1996. Okay. And uh, when I moved over there, I started painting. I thought I was going to quit graffiti because I thought, oh, there's no graffiti in New Jersey. And uh, I found it to be the playground for graffiti because there was, so, there was less competition. And I just started painting everything. And uh, I f treated it as if I was like a baseball player traded from one team to the other. Uh -huh. And I just started being from Jersey. Okay. You know, uh, and when I would call my friends on the phone from New York, I would say, oh, just tell them Joe from Jersey call, because I was the only one that they knew from New Jersey that was named Joe. Uh -huh. uh, but, but yeah, when we're talking about labels and being able to maintain yourself and the identity of those labels, I think simply put that what we do is, is art. I'm cool with that. I think it's about comfort, what, what, how, how we self-identify. Uh, and, and, and how that compares to the security and understandings of, of other people. Uh, I don't really, I would say that I'm an artist. I'm a, I'm a creative person. I do like the idea of being an, a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, I think that you can speak visually mm -hmm. just as much as you can speak with words. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, uh, there's a level of enthusiasm that helps, and that's the motivation. You know, um, you're a communicator. We we are communicators. Uh, this this world uh, this world has color because uh, of folks like us. You know. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I'm very passionate about graffiti, even though I'm a little. I'm a little kind of take it or leave it with it. You know, right now, uh, I do have a passion for painting, communicating, expressing. 
I'm an artist. Uh, there are good and there are good and bad people in all these different things. You know, the people that we're painting with today, they're they're good people. Mm -hmm. They're on a level. That's why I, that's why I called them. You know, that's why I reached out to them. Um, all very nice people. Yeah. I remember the first time that I saw you. I didn't say hi to you. I didn't talk to you. I, this was Miami Art Basel, 2011, and you had just scored a wall that had a red. The bottom was red, and you just did all these circles. Oh yeah, really I remember that. long. And I was like, holy shit, that's like a long. What the hell is he doing there with all those circles? And those circles ended up being the eyes to like a multitude of faces. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, that shit's so sick. Oh, thank you. Uh, very beautiful. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's Rhyme. Like, he's like a legendary dude. It's like, I, like, I was uh, in front. I was in the Fountain Fair, uh, art fair. And I enjoyed it from afar, uh, these awesome characters. And I'm kind of like cartoony, too. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. Yeah, it was it was a very beautiful first introduction into your art. Do you uh, still go to Miami Art Basel every now and then? It's hard to get walls there now. You can't just roll up to a wall and be like, "I'm painting this now." I, you know, I I when it comes to Art Basel, I I was going down there and painting in Wynwood in like 2007, 2008, 2009, all the way up. And each year I returned, it got a little bit more busy, a little bit more organized, a little bit more structured, a little bit more corporate. Mm -hmm. When I first started going down there, you would have to drive a mile outside of Windward to go get water from a gas station. Mm -hmm. The last time I was there, there's like graffiti themed or street art themed restaurants. And there's a lot of competitiveness for these murals and big events and all that. And it, it's just been uh, homogenized into something that just really doesn't resonate with me. Mm. Um, Seems like everybody just wants to go there to make it and get attention, while you probably, that's not your agenda, you know? I, I don't know, you know? I, sometimes we like to have attention, you know? I, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it, it depends on how we feel. Uh, but there's just some things about it that just... The last time I was there, they closed off the streets so that you had to walk into Wynwood, and the people that were walking on the street were there to party and get drunk and go to different things and stuff like that, and they had no interest whatsoever in art. Mm. You could tell. It like, you know, it just, it just, it, it felt like, you know, like when I was in New Orleans walking on Bourbon Street, you know, just like a bunch of party people just drunk and acting a fool and all that kind of stuff, and they don't give a fuck about art, really. You know, like uh, the, the, the most they care about it is to take a selfie in front of it. Mm. You know, and, and it just it just it just didn't feel right in my heart to even paint there. So I wouldn't paint there. Like the last time I was there, I refused to paint mm. in in that energy. Mm. I, I was just too I was too sensitive for it or I just felt like aesthetically like I, I'm, I've become picky. Like, uh, you know, if, if 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 there's stuff around me that doesn't resonate with me, I won't paint in in that place or in that environment or next to that uh it's just it's just my comfort level of, of of where i'm at and i think i started to feel that way about those kind of events but and i think that some of it had to do with even growing up in new york city i'm born in brooklyn uh i grew up in new york city um and i've seen that city change in such a way to kind of like an anywhere USA chain store takeover, you know, uh, Starbucks and Chase Banks and all of these things on every corner. And lost its vibe. It's lost its vibe. You know, uh, I was in a, I was in a, I was in a, a show about graffiti and street art, you know, a big show. And they had a whole thing on New York. They had a whole sort of section on it on New York. And it was it, the show was Graffiti as temp Contemporary Art. And they had a whole thing on New York. And what they were highlighting in this section of New York was stuff that happened in the 70s and 80s. Maybe a little bit of the 90s. And that's it. You know, uh, there, there's so many folks that go to New York, 
you know, they, they have these romantic ideas of what that city may or may not be. Uh, they go through a lot of effort to convince their, let's say, their, their parents to let them go to college there. Or they save up their money to go get an apartment there or whatever. And they go there and, and they, they are the ones creating, you know, that, that vibe of New York. But I, I started to feel like an outsider in that place. Mm. I, would, I, lived in, I lived in Williamsburg. I lived in an area where there were no native. It was rare. You know, like the way I talk, some people, they start kind of laughing at the way I talk because I have an accent. I, I have a New York accent. Yeah, I noticed. Um, I just felt like an outsider in that place. I felt like I didn't resonate with that particular energy. The more I opened up that box, that Pandora's box, the less... I felt comfortable being there. I said I knew I needed to leave, and uh, my journey across America now with the Roadmap Tour, it, 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 there's, many, there's many reasons for it, but one of the reasons is uh, to understand myself as an American by doing a tour of this country and seeing what you know the underlying uh, uh, norms are. Or, 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 or carry o collective carryovers are between all these places. And perhaps there's a pocket uh, in this country that does resonate with me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because I, my, my end goal, when I had my vision uh, of the future a couple of years ago, it, was, it told me to do this show in France, don't date, keep my head down, make this, these paintings, do this stuff, take all the money and go live in Italy. And, and do all this stuff in southern Italy. That's what I was going to do. That was my plan, and COVID hit, and I was confused because I was so convinced that, that it was so. Uh, and me returning here is, is, I did feel like an outsider in Europe. I did feel like an outsider in France. I did feel that there were some things, some norms in, in Europe that, uh, that were a bit uncomfortable for me. Uh, but there's quite a lot of that here in America too and in and, 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 and a lot of ways I do feel like an outsider yeah when I, you're I, a unique individual the, you can feel like an alien wherever you go or you can try to be fit in with everything since we're all just a, a mix of different ingredients mm -hmm. so on that topic of home, what is home? You've, you know, grew up in New York, you've been in New Jersey, you lived in LA, you lived in Paris, now you're mm -hmm. on the road. Have you identified what the sense of home is? Well, I've been, I've been exploring that topic since, um, I mean, for the past few years, I've been exploring that topic, but uh, I've actually been writing a book about home. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so, so these two books here, uh, this is the first book I wrote. I, so what I do is, is I have these, these composition notebooks that remind me of being in school. They're very uh -huh. informal. They're flexible. Yeah, I got one too. Yeah. They? <laughs> uh, they're cheap. <laughs> they're cheap, uh, but, you know, their value, their value is what you put into it. Right. Um, this first book, I, I started to put questions or intentions as the subject of the book. So this book here, this book here, uh, the, the question that I put forward in the book is where am I from? Mm. And everything here in, in order, all different channeled states, all, whether it be through uh, sleeping at night with a candle and laying on my back to get into that in-between state, or sitting in a ceremony like like I got really good at ayahuasca like being able to sit up and write mm -hmm. I was using these calligraphic pens I got really good at it mm. uh, it's a little awkward and yeah. I've also been able in psychedelic states to be able to stand up and paint uh -huh. which is a little awkward at first but you, you get it's like standing up on a surfboard yeah eventually you could do it uh -huh. um, but this book is where am I from and all that information is in there but this book which I started on May 3rd is the subject is home uh -huh. And everything in here is about that idea of home. It's uh -huh. about it's about finding uh, that feeling of home uh, first and foremost within yourself. 
You know, there are so many people out there that feel uncomfortable in their own skin or, or, or within the idea of their identity. You know, and we, and we battle with that. Quite a, quite a few of us battle with that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it starts, it starts again with ourselves and then, of course, our connection with, you know, this, this place we're in right now. Like this, this, this earth certainly is a home, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're all just aspects of earth, right? Mm -hmm. Everything here is earth. True. The cameras. Um, that incense, the butterfly, you and me—we're all Earth, right? Yeah. It's our, it's our, it's our, sen it's our, our desire to understand things that we begin to differentiate and and commit ourselves to those uh, categories and all that kind of stuff. We are, we are uh, category fiends, you know. But if we can let go of all of these different terms and we understand that this is all one big body, and uh, Certainly, the Earth itself is 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 not a big ball of dirt, uh -huh. right? It's not a rock. It's an entity. It's it's an entity, and 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 the proof is 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 right here and in, in, in underneath my skin. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a living, thinking, feeling um, um, aspect of this planet. So yeah, I I I've, I've I, I think about all these things about home. And my journey, my, my journey in, in 2018, it led to me ending a relationship, uh, which was hard because we were together for years. Uh, but I, it, it, it had to happen. And that caused me to be in an uncomfortable situation of sleeping in my art studio in New York City. Uh, being a successful artist, people say, oh man, you made it, you're a successful artist. And I'd be like, oh, word, really? I'm a successful <laughs> artist. You know, uh, you see it's, where I sleep. <laughs> no, but, but, you know, but I love it. I love the cowboy lifestyle. I yes. love, I love roughing it, man. It, it's, it's, it's what I enjoy most. It's, it makes me feel alive. Uh -huh. But uh, I had to, in order for me to, to go through these understandings, I had, it's like construction. If you were going to, if you were going to do a gut renovation of the home that you're buying, you have to make a mess before it gets better. Mm. And, and I think that that's what happened with me is, 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 is the foundation of who I was was unstable. And I had to do a full gut renovation of, 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 of my sense of self mm -hmm. and make a mess for a while, but have the commitment to, to iron it all out in, in some form yeah. or to be committed to spending the rest of my life on that journey. Mm. So it's like you got to destroy yourself in order to recreate yourself properly. Right. And, and since, since I opened up that box, I haven't been able to be comfortable in one place, whether it be circumstances pushing me in one way or another, or my desires doing the same. Uh, in France, I felt like an outsider. It didn't feel like home. In New York City, the place that I was born in and that I returned to New York from California. I lived in California for eight years. And in 2013, I returned to New York after, an, after another failed relationship. I, I said, where can I go? I thought about going to Detroit. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was, I, my, my, my friend lived in Detroit, and I was either going to go to Detroit or I was going to go to New York. And I went and spent like a month in Detroit just to kind of feel it out. And I was like, fuck, everything closes at 10 o'clock here, you know? I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to New York and I'm going to try to figure out who my father is because I, I realize that this, this is bothering me. Mm. At least I'm going to find out who he is and, and see if I could get past that because I think it, 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 it creates quirks. It creates issues within me and maybe I'm, maybe I'm figure it out. Mm. Uh, but I've never been able to get comfortable. In France, I wasn't able to get comfortable. I did feel like an outsider. I felt like an outsider in New York. When I got kicked out of Europe... When I got, when I got kicked out of Europe, <laughs> are you talking to us? No, I think he's just. Uh, is there a problem? Oh, we're just doing a, a podcast interview back here. Could, Could we have another ten minutes, please? Sure. Yeah, we're not, so we're, not, we're not street people or anything. We're, Thank you so much. Right. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't feel like a, I didn't. I felt like an outsider in New York City as my desires and awareness began to shift. So I left. I went to to France. Didn't quite feel like uh, at home there, and I felt like I needed to to search and discover myself. And even when I got kicked out of France and have I still have a, 
a two-year ban against me in Europe. I continue to pay for my, my house and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I was sleeping on a couch at my friend Dave's house in Queens and not wanting to rent a place in New York or live in New York again and uh, just juggling. I had a, I, I, was, I was in a toxic relationship and I was with a woman and she refused to leave my house in France. Uh, and it was just a lot of trouble, a lot of issues. Uh, I was still paying rent for that place for eight months after I left. Mm planned this whole cross-country adventure uh, and then my house was robbed over there mm. they didn't take my paintings they took my JBL extreme 2 you know oh. I have the I have the flip five well that's better <laughs> they took that they they they, uh, they took my secondhand flat screen TV that I got from you know my manager Claude and mm. they ransacked my house and it just, it really hurt me, you know, like to see all my stuff, just like my neighbor showed me pictures of it, like Being just my there. stuff just thrown all over the floor and everything. It just really hurt me. You In know? Peru as a kid, they emptied my house two times and coming back home and seeing your Atari gone and your TV gone, it's like, oh, who took my Atari? It's yeah. so weird. Yeah, it, it just made me feel like, well, I can't even... And I, I continue to pay for that place just to have a feeling that I do have a home, that I'm not homeless. Mm -hmm. So I just paid it. You know, whatever that overhead a month was, I just continue to pay it. Mm. Just as a man. As a man, I need to have a home. Yeah. You know? But there I was sleeping on a couch in New York, <laughs> planning this extravagant thing. As I said, it was, a, it was a, a Sprinter van, and then we were, like, smoking some weed at my boy's house in Queens and Anchorman part two came on and they were driving cross country in an RV and I said, that's what I want to do. Mm. I want to go cross country in an RV. That's, that's what I want to do. So I created it. Yeah, right. I, I did everything I could to connect the right dots to, to create it. And even then, you know, I get, I, my house was robbed so there was no keeping that place. So now my, my home is that is that vehicle that we've been driving across America in uh -huh. that I barely know how to drive? I do know how to drive it, but uh, you know, like backing up and all that kind of stuff is a little intimidating. Yeah, that's where I live. That is the first home that I've ever owned, uh -huh. or that I've agreed to make payments on. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but none of this, none of this. Do we ever really own anything? We're ephemeral. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, if I if I sell a painting to someone. How long do they own it for? How long is it in their possession for? Are they just temporary caretaker, caretaker, caretaker? <laughs> caretakers. Are they, are they, are they temporary caretakers of that experience? <laughs> I, I think Owners. that's what, yeah, <laughs> they, they, they basically are, are paying you to have the permission to be the caretakers of your art for a while. Right. And at some point, it'll get passed on to someone else, or maybe it ends up in the right place, or maybe it gets destroyed. Who knows? Yep. But right. how long is any of this stuff really going to stick around anyway? Who knows, man? Who knows? <laughs> so yeah. we accept the reality of impermanence in this, in this dimension. It's, it's, it's this, this reality, and, and I've, I've, been, I've dwelled on it since I was a teenager. It's like, what is it called? An, what's, what's an oxymoron? It's like, it like it's a contradiction. It's, it's a con this, this reality... The best way I, I'm able to digest it is is it's very much an oxymoron. It's 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 it is everything and nothing. Mm -hmm. It's 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 the beginning and the end. It's 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 what is it? Alpha and omega. It's it's mm. all of it. You know, uh, things can be seen as yes and no at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about impermanence, uh, this episode is. Uh, coming closer to a conclusion we got a wall going up down there that we'll jump and spray paint a little something on we got a friendly neighbor who's giving us uh, permission to <laughs> use this back uh, alley a little bit longer but uh, yeah this I, I could pick your brain for like a lot longer on a number of subject matters but I really like resonate with you, Thank you. on so many things Likewise. from like you know you're a successful artist yet still you're sleeping in a couch because you know I owned my apartment in 
in Montreal and in Peru, yet I was sleeping in a small basement in Denver because I stood for my convictions, for my medical decisions. You know, sometimes being an artist and being authentic, even in success, whatever the fuck that means, you end up, you know, in what some people would think you not uh, a nice situation, but you accept it, you flow. And then there's also the side of the medicines and you putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and processes that destroy your whole being but makes you be birthed into a newer, better version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So would you have some final words for us, for the viewers of this humble show? Of course. I could, I could, I could say something. Um, how, about I, how about I read to you the titles of the paintings that I made driving across America? Sure. Okay. I got to look at my phone though. So part of my phone. Oh no, that's okay. We, we're not anti-technology. We got these lovely cameras and uh, mixers and etc. to capture the beauty of this moment that will be gone the next few minutes okay. to be moved into the next one. So, so again, each, each line of this is a painting done at a, di a particular point in America. And they all happened as they did in that moment. And the stuff that was sort of written within it was written within it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this, and this is a commentary on this present situation and where we are here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it says... <laughs> it says, it says, um, As will moves with this, inside or out, totally free. For this effect... Here we are in this wish. Although attention has no ending, all as mentioned is worth befriending. In potion or passion, to find love again. Oh, beautiful. It's, yeah. a, po it's a poem you wrote with yeah. paintings as you cruise. All the titles, that, that's, just what it, that's just what it said. Uh -huh. You know? But I, you know, it, it, it's, it just says something about free will and that uh, these decisions that are either... Uh, contemplative or hurtful or, or um, you know uh, impacting or whatever it's something that we we intentionally create as as as, as one big unit you know here we are in this wish uh -huh. you know uh, we have a will to be here we don't have to be here we could go jump off a bridge if we like right you know uh, we can here, duck out if we want to yeah and and you know it's up to us to to come to a comfortable place in it and perhaps we can express those feelings in whatever way we desire. Totally. But Try to enjoy a, it for all it is. Yeah. But love is a really dope radio station to tune into. Hell yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joe. This was a beautiful conversation. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you guys for tuning to another week and interview of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends. Uh, please make sure to like comment, subscribe, share so more people can listen to it and I'll see you next time. Blessings! Woo! Next episode my guest will be Anya Amador. I think that we're conditioned to base how we feel about things on what we already know about them. So we're looking at our current conditions, we're going off a bunch of past experiences, we're taking feedback from what other people are telling us, and that's how we form our beliefs. It doesn't matter what anyone else tells me or what's already happened, I know that there are infinite possibilities in every single moment, and once you accept that truth that anything is possible, then it could also be possible that it's going to work out. So I think it goes back to going general with it all and just remembering that feeling good is going to bring about good experiences so i want to practice that on a daily basis not in a way that doesn't honor my negative feelings but in a way that allows me to move forward right and just constantly finding something to appreciate because appreciation brings more things to appreciate so please make sure to subscribe like comment and share big thanks and see you next episode peace